Assalamu alaikum. My name is Abuze Muhammad Afzal. I'm working here in company J Marine in Nigeria. I'm a foreign national, Pakistani national. So we were abducted on 28th March uh, from the Abuja Kaduna train and uh, we are here. Uh, we are 62 people and uh, the conditions are not very good. So we are appealing to the government of Pakistan and government of Nigeria and to the whole world international community so that they can help us. From Triple E Media, I'm Ramat Mohammed, and this is The Backstory. On the 28th of March, Dr. Abuzar Mohammed Afsal, a Pakistani national, was kidnapped alongside 61 others while traveling by train from Abuja to Kaduna. The clip we just played for you was released on the 25th of May, about two months after the abduction. Dr. Afzal is in the video alongside six other Nigerian hostages, and each of them pleads with the Nigerian government for help. Another month goes by after that video was released and Dr. Afzal and the others were still in captivity. By the time July came around, it seemed like all hope was lost. But what Dr. Afzal and the others did not know was that a team had been working on negotiating their release. On Saturday, the 9th of July, that marked 100 days in captivity and it was also the day that Dr. Afzal and six others would gain their freedom. That Saturday, a team of Good Samaritans coordinated by Mr. Tukur Mamu started making their way to a remote location somewhere in the bush. It was a meeting point given by the kidnappers. According to Mr. Mamu, as the rescue team was making their way to this location, they encountered a military checkpoint right before the entrance to the bush. The soldiers stopped them, obviously, and asked, where are you going? The team explains that they have been negotiating the release of kidnapped victims and that they're on their way to the rendezvous points to get to the freed victims. The soldiers say, hang on, and they put a call through to the commanding officer who gives the okay for the team to continue. At this point, presumably, the soldiers hang up the phone, point the team toward the entrance of the bush, wave them off and wish them luck. The rescue team travels for about 40 to 50 kilometers into the bush, and that's where they saw the seven kidnapped victims, whose freedoms they had been negotiating. Obviously, there must have been relief and joy on both sides. The rescue team and the hostages were so happy to see each other. And before they left the bush, the seven hostages, including one woman and six men, stood in line to take a photo. Four armed men joined them in the photo, presumably their kidnappers. The seven survivors rescued that Saturday have since been reunited with their families. And while we wait for the release of the 43 that still remain in custody of kidnappers, we can't help but ask, how is this happening? How is it that a train can be attacked? 62 people captured and transported to a remote location and kept there for over three months. How is it that during this time, civilians like Mr. Tukul Mamu are able to establish contact and negotiate the release of 18 people? How is all of this happening while the Nigerian government and the Nigerian security forces stand by? To try to understand what could be happening, we do what we usually do at Triple E. We read. We came across a book called Kidnap, Inside the Ransom Business by Anya Shortland. In this book, she looks at cases of kidnaps around the world and tries to explain how kidnapping works as a ransom business. The kidnap for ransom business is essentially a logistics problem. You have to first intercept your target at location A, move them to location B without getting caught or intercepted by security forces. You then have to keep them alive in location B, which is another logistics problem because now you have to make sure that food and water is readily available as well as medicinal supplies. While you're holding on to the hostages, you have to guard them to ensure that they don't escape and you have to establish contact with a family member or some other interested party who will negotiate a ransom for the hostage. Now that's usually done through phone calls and that's another logistic problem because 
you have to ensure your location can be traced. Then once the ransom payment is agreed on, there's the logistics issue of receiving the payments before the hostage is released. And of course, the release of the hostage needs to happen without the kidnapper getting caught by security forces. Because of these logistical issues, most kidnaps are actually resolved pretty quickly. According to Andrew Shortland, about 81% of kidnaps last less than one week. And because the logistics issues increase with the more hostages you have, most kidnappings for ransom, they involve only one or two individuals. But the kidnappings that have been happening across northern Nigeria since 2014, they're different. There are mass kidnappings involving 10 or more people. And we're even seeing kidnappings involving hundreds of school children taken at once. The Kaduna trained kidnappers took 62 full-grown adults. How do you move so many hostages and keep them for over three months? It's a logistical nightmare. The only way to pull off something like this is if you have a protector in place. And we don't mean protector like Almighty God, the protector. No, we mean that in order for the kidnappings that are happening in northern Nigeria to happen, there has to be a network of humans that are protecting the business. According to Anya Shortland, in any community, there is a market for protection. People in communities generally just want to live in peace and they will offer payment to anyone who can guarantee them protection over their lives and their livelihoods. That payment can come in the form of taxes, for example, taxes paid to either a legitimate government or taxes paid to an extra legal organization like the mafia. In exchange for paying taxes, the government or the mafia will offer protection services. Sometimes they also offer other services like education and healthcare. When people know who they are supposed to pay for protection and how they're supposed to pay for protection, then the protection market is stable and there's relative peace. But when the community has no clue on how and whom to pay for protection, then there's a power vacuum. Aspiring protectors, they start to come out of the woodwork to reveal themselves and demonstrate their power. Kidnapping is a powerful signal to a protector's reach and capability, especially when that kidnapper's goal in the long term is to control territory. Kidnapping one or two people is challenging enough, but kidnapping tens of people, hundreds and Holding them long enough to extract ransoms without the Nigerian government catching you or prosecuting you, that is power. This is the fundamental difference between kidnapping in northern Nigeria versus kidnapping in other parts of the country. The end game is not purely about money. It's about territorial control. It's about power. It's about who can establish a monopoly on violence within a territory. The protector who is able to defend and guarantee the life, liberty, and property rights of the individuals within his territory will have legitimacy in the eyes of the people in that territory. Now, ideally, that protector should be the Nigerian government. But two recent events in Zamfara state are strong signals that the government of Nigeria has lost ground to the bandits in part of the Northwest. Therefore, in order to deal decisively with the situation in our respective communities, Zamfara state government has no option than to take the following measures. One, government has henceforth directed individuals to prepare and obtain local weapons to defend themselves against the bandits. In a press conference held on the 26th of June, the Commissioner for Information for Zamfara State, Ibrahim Dosara, issued the statement you just heard. The Zamfara State government is essentially saying they cannot defend their citizens. They don't have a monopoly on violence in their territory. The second event happened only this past weekend. The Emir of Endo Tundaji Emirate in Zamfara State, Aliyu Marafa, on Saturday, turbaned repentant notorious bandit leader Adu Aliru as the Sarikim Fulani. In June of 2020, that's only two years ago, the Kazena State Police Command declared Adamu Aliero and Kuza wanted, and they placed a 5 million naira bounty on his head. 
dead or alive. Last Saturday, he was turbaned as the leader of the Fulani in the Yandoto area, a move that appears to be supported by the community. It's deja vu all over again. We've seen this before. When the Nigerian government cannot provide welfare and security to an area of the country, they cede protection of that area to an extra legal group. In the Northeast, protection was ceded to religious groups and eventually those groups morphed into Boko Haram. Now the Nigerian government is bogged down in the Northeast and is once again ceding its role as protector to another extra legal group. And perhaps the government's calculation is a simple one. The bandits in the Northwest are currently fighting each other to establish dominance. In order for there to be stability in the Northwest, one of those bandit groups will rise above the rest. If one group establishes a monopoly on violence, there will be relative peace in the territory. They can regulate the other players within the criminal enterprise. But at what cost? <laughs> The Backstory is a Triple E Media production. Production copyright 2022 Triple E Media Productions. If you enjoyed this episode of The Backstory and you would like to hear more, go to our website at 234audio.com to play the sample content. Then download our app from the Google Play Store for even more episodes. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel at 234audio to watch the video for this episode. Make sure to click the notification bell, like, and leave a comment. Our episodes can also be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and leave a comment. This episode of The Backstory was produced by Ramat Mohammed, Antonietta Kalunta, Alexandra Gekpe, Uche Mba, Dominic Tabakaji, and Sam Tabakaji. Executive Producer, Ramat Mohammed. <laughs>